Good afternoon. Um, so we've got two very young, uh, we've got people who were well, uh, editors when they were very young, they still are very young. Um, we are not going to direct. Thank you. Not true, but thank you so much. It was well, a young save. at heart. <laughs> it was a good save. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's a young, your heart's young in the right place. And, <laughs> young, at, young at heart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it matters, right? I think in some ways, if you're connected to writing or yeah. reading, you have to be somewhat young, right? Your heart has to sort yes. of have this Agreed. optimism. Um, and in, interestingly, it was Meru, while in the long list of um, all the people that she edited, she's also been Veer's editor. Yes, for more um, than one book. More than one book. Yeah. So what is the relationship between an editor in terms of a writer-editor and an, a book editor entailed? Uh, if you have to give one word, what would you be looking, what were you looking at when you were, look, when you met, when you were looking for an editor? I'll give you a editor? sentence. Yeah. I think the job of any editor as far as the writer is concerned is to make the work better. Yeah. The reason I enjoyed working with Meru is that the book we finally published was about 40% better than it would have been if I hadn't had an editor. Now it's not always true, so yeah. I was very grateful to have had her as an editor. Thank you, Veer. That's very kind of you because um, not all authors are this grateful, I can tell you. <laughs> but um, I think what you've said is right. It's the job of an editor to be invisible, I think, first of all, invisible mm -hmm. to the process, invisible to the book. Uh, I always think of it, um, imagine there's a fashion designer and there's a darzi, and the author is the fashion designer and the editor is the darzi. And it should always stay that way. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point of great editing is not to impose yourself onto the vision of the author. And obviously the same goes for darzis as well. Yeah. And um, I loved working with Veer because he was exceptionally open to the editing process. He knew mm. he had the instinct and intelligence to understand that this is not something combative. Yeah. This is not a criticism. This is all the great writers go through this process willingly and they want it. So, yeah, I really enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. But I think it's also, you know, in, Meru, in your, uh, in, in your blog that you've written, you've also said that when you're looking for an editor, there has to be, you know, you, you, I think the title was Finding an Editor Soulmate, which is very much like love, right? Or Finding a Good Therapist, possibly, um, possibly as tough. So what really is the aspect of this relationship and the, chemi and the chemistry? Because it's not only about the writer, but it's also about the editor. Shall I uh, try and answer it first and then yeah. I'll hand it to Veer? If your voice can take it. Yeah, I can take yes. it. Yeah, okay. we're trying, we're trying stronger than I look. All right, good. <laughs> um, so I think the first and most important thing in the chemistry between an author and an editor is respect. Mm. Because um, a book is an author's baby and um, you have to trust the person intellectually and also their motives mm. and their motivation to want to help you do yeah. that. And because if there is no trust and respect, uh, I don't think you can, none of this can work. I could give the best feedback to you yeah. mm. and I don't know whether you, how you would take it. Yeah. So I think once you've established that uh, you're doing this from a place of wanting, my wanting his work to be, mm. to be better and if his work is better then I benefit from it as well. Um, I, I think once you've established that basic trust and respect everything goes well from there. And the second is, of course, honesty, because um, I have to feel that I can be honest with you as an author and that you won't take it in the wrong way yeah. and that you are open and willing to at least listen. If not, you don't have to take every suggestion that an editor gives you. But if you're coming from a place of openness and listening, then I think both the editor and the author benefit from it. So I think those are the main things for me. Uh, yeah. I think there's like, when we talk about editing in the newspaper world yeah. or the magazine world, we're talking about what a film director in that they put the thing together. Hmm. But there's another kind of editing, which is the kind of editing where you look at a book or you look at an article hmm. and you think, how can I make it better? Yeah. How can I catch the obvious mistakes? Hmm. Now, we've never really had that in India and it comes to journalism. Yeah. I remember when I joined the Hindustan Times, the guys on the desk who was supposed to correct the copy of the reporter, spoke, worse, spoke and wrote worse English than the reporters. Mm. For instance, things like, which now I think is pretty obvious, like the article, The, yeah. nobody knew where to put it. It mm. would be, there was a crime yesterday in the Delhi. Mm. 
Hmm. So you had to say you can't put, put the, the yeah. uh, beyond the point you can't explain because either the guy sees it or he doesn't see hmm. it or the lady sees hmm. it or hmm. doesn't see it. So I find now that in many ways the standard of that kind of editing has improved. Hmm. I do, a, I actually take a no chances my wife who's an editor, yeah. edits all my copy before it goes in, wow. including my book, everything. So yeah. I'm pretty sure by the time it goes in or how good or bad it is. Yeah. But there's, on the print where I do a column every yeah. week, there's a, an editor called Prashant Dix Dixit. And I don't think there's a single time when I've put a sent in a column and it's not been at least 20% better because of what he's done. Yeah. So that's rare. And yeah. as a uh, columnist or an author, you're very grateful for I, it. I think, I think also it's important because I think if you are a journalist, your desk somehow it's a combative or almost a combative relationship while with, with, with in terms of a book, it's a different thing. But you know, I wanted to ask you um, I wanted to ask Meru first and then I'll ask Veer. Um, you know, people dream of become, becoming writers, right? Your mother was, is a writer. You've sort of grown up with the word. Your uh, Patrick is a writer. Was writer. So sort of, what makes you dream? Do you ever dream? Did anybody dream to become an editor? I mean, what, what does an editor really do? I, uh, no, Good I, question. I, yes, <laughs> that's a great question. So editors are in general, I would just go back to the first thing you said. Do you have to be young at heart? And Veer, I think, is young at heart, yeah. but I am not. <laughs> uh, I am very also old at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And I think editors are old at heart, many of them. Hmm. And they're sort of these long-suffering, old at heart kind of souls. Uh, I don't, and it, it definitely there is a personality type, yeah. quite introverted, solitary, wanting to do, um, you, you know, just a more invisible kind of work. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so I would say that, you know, is the quality that draws people to what did, what did, why did I become an editor? Mm -hmm. Honestly, I didn't even know what an editor did till I became one mm. because I finished college. I was at Stephen's and I had no plan about what to do with the rest of my life and I just drifted around for a while. Um, everybody that sounds else. like a journalist, huh? I know, yeah, but it's borderline, yeah. yeah. And um, then I was like, what should I do now? Mm. And I knew Ravi Singh of Penguin and I'd met him a lot. Uh, you know, over the years, I just one day on an impulse phoned him up and I said, I want to be an editor. And he said, okay. Uh, I said, will you give me a job? And he said, okay, let me think about it. And he gave me some freelance work to do. So after doing a few books, then he gave me a job in, at Penguin. And so I've been at Penguin and Random House and then Peng Penguin Random House for nearly 20 years since mm -hmm. that day. And um, it's, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of job which just grows on you. There's no... Even today, to this day, if you want to go and learn how to be an editor, there's no school. Mm. I would say it's a kind of apprenticeship yeah. which you people accidentally fall upon. Yeah. But having said that, I would encourage more people to think about being editors because it's incredibly rewarding. Mm. And I've loved every time I've been in, I find it a privilege to be able to work with so many amazing people and have them trust me with their work is a real privilege. Yeah. So I encourage the people um, who, you know, want to be writers. If some of you also think that you want to be editors, uh, please do it. So, you know, you, um, you know, like you just mentioned, a lot of this, uh, you know, when, when, you've been, when you've been a journalist for a very, very long time, yeah. when you're a good reader, um, when you've been an editor yourself and not necessarily the copy editor, but essentially someone who commissions, it's also very difficult to put yourself on page and sort of accept, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, there is this whole aspect of, um, in, in it sort of goes into a philosophical thing, where, you know, if you, um, if you look at all the, you know, you have to, you have to also, to, to accept and to receive, you also have to be a kind of person to do that. You know, it is, it's also in some way being to be, you, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. So when you've reached that top, how do you actually allow someone else, your baby really, into somebody else's hand? How difficult, I mean, how much of it is about vulnerability? How much of it is about keeping your open mind? How much of it is about listening? How much, how do you sort of, my question is really, how do you s prepare yourself to be a re the receiver rather than, the one who in gives out instructions. It's like when the editor becomes the editor. Yes, the editor or a doctor. I mean, all doctors are terrible patients. Or, well, mostly. Sorry for yeah, the generalization. Except that, at least in my case, the process begins 
before editing. Like, yeah. since I take my last yeah. book, which she published, there was one. Bidding war sounds very grandiose, but there were at least two, there three people who put explained, uh, displayed an interest mm -hmm. and had pay, offered mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And I went, didn't go with the highest bidder. I went with Penguin because I knew she would do the book. Mm -hmm. So by the time you do that, there's already a certain level of trust. You know you're giving the book to somebody who has a sensibility and that which will help her understand your work mm. quite apart from all the other stuff. Now, for instance, when my, my book went, I sent it to her chapter by chapter mm. and it would come back with little notes in the margin yeah. saying, this is interesting, tell the full story. Mm. Okay, this has gone on too long. Mm. Can we cut this short? Mm. And you realize then that because my book was a memoir, yeah. you sometimes you sort of regurgitating stream of consciousness yeah. nonsense and you need somebody there to see it from the perspective of the reader. Mm. So the moment you see the editor as somebody who's like a reader, mm. then you say to yourself that this is a sympathetic reader who's told me this is wrong. Mm. If it went out as it was, there'll be many unsympathetic readers who will tell me in public that's actually yeah. rubbish. Yeah. So the editor is your ally and in many ways your protector from the mm. rest of the world. Mm. So, you know, I was reading um, um, this thing where, you know, Robert Gottlieb talks about this aspect of a relationship. And I think with Robert Caro, he says that at the end of 50 years, they, they we possibly had a friendship. Um, and my question is that I think there is this, um, there is this moment where he narrates what happened with him in Clinton. And he goes into, you know, um, Clinton, I mean, he's editing Clinton's um, memoir. And that would be very interesting to edit. Right, and he says that um, apparently, you know, Clinton is in this room filled, filled with all of his, well, flunkies, my word, not his. Um, and he says that, you know, uh, I'm sure we will have a good relationship. And this guy turns around and says, well, I'm, uh, you, you can ask, he said, actually, Clinton says, you can ask anybody I'm very good with to work with. And uh, Gottlieb turns around and said, well, well, Mr. President, in this case, you will realize you're actually working for me. Okay, and he said he used to, um, the, and the interviewer asked him, why don't, when you say Bill, why don't you say Mr. President? Could Mr. President, when he said, I couldn't believe that I cannot have that relationship without, I mean, I cannot have that level of formality. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you've edited so many people. You've edited, you know, Amitav Ghosh, you've edited Jhumpa Lairi. How do you sort of create this informality with someone who has achieved or has is a very accomplished writer and has had other editors so where what is the formula of sort of you know becoming their ally rather than and you know sort of becoming of rekindling the spark or in no I, I think what you say is interesting but personally um, I've never been that kind of editor um, I quite like a certain amount of formality because I think it helps to, you know, I, I think if you try to make that relationship with, it, uh, with your author into everything, that complicates things, for me at least. I want that person, I want to be a blank slate for that person. I don't want them to have to think about my feelings or what I might think. It is, at its heart, a professional relationship. Yeah. And so I don't necessarily even seek to introduce formality into it. And if having worked with you know, somebody over a period of time, a friendship naturally develops. Yeah. Because it's a very close thing, yeah. working with somebody about, the, for example, in the case of a memoir, you're, it's quite a personal thing. I, and I think I would go as far as to say that's true of any relationship. Yeah. The minute you try to introduce um, an element into it, I don't know if it works. So you have to let every relationship as an editor with your author develop very organically because mm. they will not all be the same. Mm. And many of my authors have become very close friends over time. Yeah. But I don't think I ever set out saying I want to be your friend yeah. because I don't know if it works that way. Yeah, but I mean, I think there is an element of being able to and have you, would you, would you, would you say that that's no, it? No, I, I don't buy all this friend stuff at yeah. this stage of my life. I'm not looking to make new friends. Yeah. I'm just looking for people who will help make my work the best it is. Yeah, I agree. And I think yeah. that's how it should be. Yeah. 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 Okay. So my question also is that, you know, if you look at it, both of you came into um, the field when you came in, you know, you were, part, you were the youngest editor when there was, and, you know, journalism was sort of finding its feet um, yeah. in a way. Um, and Meru, when you came in, you know, publishing had already established itself. You were, uh, you benefited from the generation of people who actually, you know, 
um, were first in their field. And you know, I, I was at, at the bookmark where there was um, a 40 year re reunion of Kali, where there was Urvashi Butalia and Ritu Menon. And they said when they were starting out in editors, they were, it was all, it was a completely male dominated field. And then, you know, now of course it's a completely, it's the other way, the pendulum has spun the other way. And I wanted to ask you as, as people who were, you know, when, you know, how much of it is about learning? You, of course, had to learn on the job and to become men. This thing. How much of youth and how much of that, you know, how much of it, how, how, how did you un basically walk onto this uncharted territory? What did you learn? Did you have, you know, how did you sort of create this space um, where there wasn't any, you had to, you had, I mean, most of the people you had to report, who were reporting yeah. to you were older. All how of you them, yeah. yeah, all of them. So how do you sort of create this space? Because in some ways, an editor who is a journalistic editor is also very much what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who will show you the story or shape your story or sort of hold your hand. So in some ways, it's also a relationship. And how do you look at yeah. that? But see, when I entered journalism, I was very lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. The reason I became an editor when I was so young was not because I was any good. It's just that there was hardly anybody in the business. Yeah. The magazine boom was just beginning. Hmm. And I'll give you an example. The Times of India, which was then yeah. the big boy in Bombay, offered me a job as an assistant editor. Hmm. And the only qualification you needed for that job was you had to have an Oxbridge degree. Yeah. And then you went into this cabin and you wrote three leaders, three editorials. Yeah. Every week you took your check and you went home. Mm. The guys who actually produced the paper had nothing to do with you. Mm. And the editors had nothing to do with them. There's a very famous story about Shamlal, yeah. who was a legendary editor, editor of the Times yeah. of India, going... To what he made an infrequent appearance at a party and there was a guy holding forth and Shamlal was really impressed and he said to him, he said, you're very well informed. Mm -hmm. What do you do? He says, sir, you don't know me, but I'm your news editor. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the kind of distinction yes. there was between editors yeah. and reporters. So by generation that came in, we had to sort of start from scratch. I was very fortunate to work for Arun Puri, yeah. who was starting the magazine revolution mm. and was introducing new standards. Mm. But he, because we had to rewrite virtually everything mm. in India today and then in Bombay, which I edited, we had massive problems finding people who could do it. And because editors were in the sense of writing and correcting when unknown in Indian journalism. Mm. And the editor was just the big boss. Anybody yeah. wanted to be an editor because the disparity in salaries between the editors, even these little kids who'd come from Oxford and were made as editors, mm. and the people who did the grunt work was so massive. Mm. Everybody joined just to become editor. Mm. I remember Arun saying to me in frustration because all the people on the desk want to do other things. Hire people who want to die as sub-editors. <laughs> it, it was not actually possible. That's and then true. Suman Dubey was the yeah. editor of India today, said to me, hire English MAs. Huh. They will know how to write. They will learn very quickly. There are no jobs for them. <laughs> and they'll be grateful when you hire them. Yeah, yeah. So it was a very, very different world hmm. in those days. Yeah. And, and you? So um, as you rightly said, I was lucky to have stepped into the office. Uh, I was 24 when I joined Penguin. And in the same office, there was an extraordinary group of people hmm. who were very generous with their time in teaching me and all the other hmm. young editors how to edit. So in one office you had David Davidar and Ravi Singh and Kartika and you had Krishan Chopra who now heads Bloomsbury hmm. and uh, you had Nandini Mehta, you had Udayal Mitra who now heads Harper Collins. So there was this moment for two years when we just all sat next mm. to each other and then people of course went off and started to yeah. do different things. But for me the greatest challenge when I was a young editor was to be taken seriously yeah. by older men. Nobody used to take me seriously if I was the one, you know, doing but the editing. But at least partly that was because you were a woman also. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. he said, yeah. She yes. said older yeah. men. You not, know, just a, not just age. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. absolutely. Okay. As yeah. a young woman, they think, well, it's also a in very Indian thing that yeah. it's... Uh, he, it's, they want. They felt like I was too junior to be handling their book. Yeah, therefore not important enough. Exactly. So everybody wants the top guy. Yeah. And they, they don't want you to do the work. But then over time, you know, once you've done a few people's books hmm. and you, you know, people tell other people that you're a very good editor, then they themselves come and ask yeah. you for it. Um, I, and I would say, I, I think that I wasn't really planning, uh, you know, about what I would do next. So... Letting things happen organically for me was the best education. Mm. 
that uh, just seeing what comes your way and learning from that is quite an underrated skill. Mm. And I think Veer in his memoir, and if you haven't read it, please do. Mm. It's Thank called you. A Rude Life. Yes. And one of the things... You can hold it up. Yeah. 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 Sorry, 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 sorry. I have it on my lap. Uh, yes. Let me hold it up. It's a Thank you, thank you. Good thank life. you, the people listening. Go yeah. on. Yeah. And you were saying. Yes. So one of the things in this book, let me do it again. Yes, yes. yes. important thank to hold it up. Everybody thank seen you. it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things about this book is, and I, I would say this is unusual, is, you know, one of the challenges of memoir, or both writing it and editing it, is writing about your childhood. Because some people have very boring childhoods. I'm sorry if this offends anyone, but True. usually it's quite dull as yeah. a reader to mm. read about somebody's childhood. Yeah. Because it's all like, you know, I had these friends and no one cares as a yes. reader. Yeah. But we had a very interesting childhood. So mm -hmm. he, uh, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit more about that, but editing the part about his childhood was the best part of the book for yeah, me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think Because I think uh, one of the characteristics which comes through yeah. for me as a reader and as an editor, is that he is also somebody who just lets things happen and see yeah. where that takes him. Yeah. And that's worked out really well for yeah. him. Yeah. That he wasn't somebody who was going and plotting and planning his next move. He doesn't mind just throwing himself into the mix and s sort of seeing what happens. Mm. And that curiosity is, yeah. I think, what um, it's a characteristic of an editor also. Yeah. Just to drift along and see what happens. Uh, I mean... I, the curiosity of him as a child and as an editor, I think, really comes through in this book. And I really urge you to read it because I enjoyed editing it. And he's had an extraordinary life. Mm -hmm. And particularly the early part, I yeah. find that fascinating because very few people can write about their childhood in such an interesting way. And with such clarity, I think. I think there, yeah. is, there is a certain aspect of clarity. And it's not a straightforward child. No, no. You know, it's, uh, parts of it are very, very difficult. But he's written about it very nicely. Yeah. Would you want to talk a little bit about no, what no, was the toughest? No, enough about my book. We don't <laughs> want to hijack the session. <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm embarrassed already. I started it, but I think now it's time to stop. But again. okay, so can, can I ask you, you know, in the sense that you said that, um, uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier and... Um, yeah. You know, we uh, we were at dinner once when there was uh, where there was Amitabh Ghosh and we were talking about New York, right? And I think the word that he used at this thing was that he was that you know there was he was bludgeoned. His writing was bludgeoned, and can you imagine bludgeoning uh, Amitabh Ghosh? Amitab no, but you know he. I mean he he he's a, he's a wonderful wonderful writer. He really is. I mean, for anybody yeah, for him, is. yeah, he is. For I mean, for it to, for anybody to try and take out way nuance from his writing, it's just. Um, it's this thing, and it it wasn't it wasn't only him. I think you said Naipaul also complained about this thing. So, but yeah, there is a certain aspect of American editing and and possibly Indian editing. Do you think that you want to talk really about about the different types of editing? I can maybe talk about that for books, but uh, and then maybe we you could talk about that. Uh, you know, there are different styles of editing in the U.S. and in the U.K. Yeah. and in India. So I'll very briefly go into how that works for books. Yeah and you know book related publications and then and he could talk about how i mean in the sense that the american i mean if you look at you look at the editor in uh, america you look at the editor in you look at you look you look at the british editor you look at indian editors there is a certain difference i mean i think it's also because the way we are american politicians are different from Im indian politicians and you think there is a certain quality of an indian editor that um, of a of a magazine or a newspaper that yeah. is different you, you explain that technically yeah. and I'll tell okay. you my yeah. own experience. I'll give the technical answer and then you can give the funny yeah. anecdotal answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so essentially, editing, there are three types of editing very broadly. There's something called developmental editing, which happens at the very earliest stage of a book or whatever you're writing, right? That's when you develop the ideas, the concepts, uh, you strengthen your argument. That's like, imagine if you're a sculptor, there's a big block of wood and you're just hacking away at it. And you don't use any finer tools. You just hack, hack, hack and get a general shape. After that, once you've got your argument and you know, you've said what you want to say, then the next stage of editing is called copy editing, where you go and you, know, you go to the line level, the sentence level, the paragraph le level and clarify. So if you're still going back to the sculpture, that's like you're now chiseling. You're, you know, kind of making a face where there was just a shape of a face. And then you go even more than that to proofreading finally, where you use your finest tools right at the end, just to make sure you haven't made any mistakes, you're like polishing, you know, you're just finishing things up. 
Now, editors in different countries do this differently. So, American editing is famously heavy-handed. You know, it's mm. leaden yeah. and heavy-handed. So, they love long opening sentences. Say, like they might say something like, when somebody was, there'll be some long-winded story and they want it, uh, you know, they want it go on for a really yeah. long time. They're very heavy-handed about style in general, saying, oh, you know, the people put an omelette over this. We'll, we only, we put an accent over this. Like the New Yorker, I think, didn't they put an accent over Uber or something like yes, that? Yes. Or some crazy thing like that. But the point is, it's, they have this thing called a style sheet, which every publication has, which is, you know, just how they spell things and where they put their italics. There's actually no logic behind it, but they do it. And they're very obsessed by it. Uh, British editors are a little bit different. They're a bit more relaxed, I would say. Uh, more curious, even. Um, less worshipful. And they're the ones who, you know, they're funnier and more, uh, they'll put in more humor. They'll, uh, they can see the lighter side of things and they sometimes see things which an American editor won't. Which is not to say one is better or one is worse, they're just different. An Indian editor, I would say, are a mix of the two. So there are some who will you know, do that very detailed line work and be obsessed by that. And there are others who are more conceptual. So there are all of these different types and that's what makes it interesting. And, yeah. you know, some, some one kind of editing might be suited to a certain kind of writer. Another one might need something else. And you have to just find your way through yeah. it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think American editing is much more thorough than editing anywhere in the world. Hmm. I haven't had a book published in America, but I'll give you a journalistic example. I've written columns for Time magazine. Hmm. And the thing you notice about, well, not now, but in the glory days of Time magazine, was you never had to read a sentence twice to know what it meant. Hmm. And I used to wonder how they got that. Hmm. And there were about five or six different people when they didn't have much time because the news magazine who in the space of a few hours edited my copy, kept coming back to me mm. and this is before the internet yeah. when they had to call or send telexes and it went all the way up to the editor mm. and they would argue about whether a word was appropriate or not, not in a bad way, in a yeah. nice sort of yeah. way, can we do this? Some of it was like obvious stuff like if I had written when the Rolling Stones came to Bombay, which is an actual example, mm. some years ago, they would say, can we say exactly how many years? Yeah. Which of course, in yeah. journalistic yeah. terms, is much, the, much better. Yeah. If I had written for a British publication, they would let it go. Yeah. Because they would say that my style was to sort of ramble on a slightly inexact sort of way. Mm. But the Americans will want everything exact. The disadvantage with that is, as Mehru suggested, often the prose is so bloody boring yeah. and so deadly earnest mm -hmm. because they take every stylistic kink that mm -hmm. you have yeah. and they edit it out. Yeah. So we, I think, in India uh, have our own tradition, which is either no editing or sort of vaguely <laughs> British editing. It's pretty extreme. But, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. but we are basically very few people, I think, at least in journalism, know how to edit copy, unfortunately. And it's going to get worse. Because of... Because, of because A, because people of are not interested in journalism, yeah, yeah, so B, they read Twitter, they yeah. read stuff think, on the yeah, internet. I think the whole idea of a journalistic style, of putting a piece together, hmm. what it requires, is not something they've grown up with. It's not something that appeals to them. Hmm. They've been taught sort of to blindly fact check. For instance, if you write a political analysis piece hmm. and there are some insights you have, which somebody's told you and you put them in, you will get a thing saying, I have looked on Please the internet. I've looked on Google, I've looked on Google and it doesn't exist. Uh, exactly. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. Google right. fact exactly. checking. Right. Now, so yes. now how do you explain this? Yes, to people? that's yeah. true. Yeah. That is that is true. It doesn't say so on Google, it does not exist. That's right. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, you know, this is a great of this thing, but you you've got edit tricks, right? Um, first I want you to tell everybody what why it's edit tricks. Okay. Uh, so I have been building an AI powered editing app which is trying to solve for this very problem that uh, Veer has talked about and Mandira has talked about, that, you know, who's building the next generation of editors? So, I learned because I was lucky to sit next to somebody who was a great editor and they taught me and I sat, sat next to somebody and I taught them. But after the pandemic, hmm. that chain has been broken because of hybrid working. <clears throat> so, senior editors and junior editors no longer sit next to each other, which means I think this will affect the quality of how the next generation of editors uh, learns how to do this job and also the availability of the editing experience to writers in general. Because if there are too few editors, I don't think most writers will get to access this quite amazing experience of being edited well. 
So I made uh, an app called Editrix.ai. Yeah. Editrix is, a, as Seema pointed out to me, is the plural of a female editor. Mm. It's an old-fashioned word, but it sounds modern. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what I made. Because I want anyone to be able to access great editing, mm. even if they may not be able to access an editor. Yeah. So that's why I made that. But is it going to be like... Um she right where there is this where there is this romance and isn't isn't it she with where she the movie yeah the movie it is right she. It is yeah she. where he falls in love, in love with Scarlett Johansson who is yeah, yeah 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 I'm quite certain that won't happen <laughs> <laughs> it's not that good guys yeah <laughs> but like how would it work I mean yeah supposing I wrote a column and I didn't want to go through mounds of not always literate sub editors I could just give it to editrix editrix yeah yeah and they would correct it and knock out all the kinks. Yes, you could upload a book, a manuscript, an academic paper, a long piece of journalism, yeah. whatever you like really. And I've trained it based on everything I have learned as an editor over time, hmm. which can't be found on Google, but yeah. it does exist. And uh, what it does is once you upload your document, it's going to tell you how to make it better just like I would. Yeah. And it'll say, well, you know, this is where I think that you've gone on too long. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe you've... Uh, this inconsistency here or whatever it is that your thing needs and give you editorial suggestions and it will also give you the choice of doing it for you if you like okay. or uh, you know some people might say I want to do it myself just tell me what it is so that's what it does. Okay. But it can only do the copy it can't yeah. do the other part of the No yeah, it does the developmental editing very very well. Well oh, I'll give you an example in my book yeah. which is an example she'll know I was ending it one particular way yeah. huh. and she said no I want it to be like the beginning, end it on a personal, personal load. Huh. So I read it that chapter yes, yes. and the book is much better for it. So could your That's exactly the kind of that? thing it would do. It would do that? So you would just select the final chapter of your book and say, I, I want to see how this ending might work out. Tell me like two or three different ways how this ending could work and what are the, give me some suggestions on how to improve it and that's exactly what it will do. Wow. So, wow. Yes. so why do we exactly. need you? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I made it, so you don't need me. Just go buy it. Just um, no. yeah, go with my devices. No. Yeah. But I think, you're, I mean, does it, does it do hand-holding? Uh, no, that's why you need me. <laughs> that's why you need you. But I wanted, okay, so we, I'm going to open up for, quest uh, for questions, but I wanted to ask you to repeat, I wanted, you know, there is this aspect um, of, of course, you know, just making the copy better, but an editor also sends a book to press, right? And there is, there are harrowing moments where you're proofreading, yeah. Um, and you're sort of this thing and staying up at night and a lot of that and I know that there was harrowing moments with that so have you which is I mean do you, do, do you have I know one editor talked about how when the book is going to press she allows her writer to call her any time of the day because it's like a baby going to this thing have you ever had harrowing experiences no so I'm not that person I'm, I've never missed even one night's sleep for anyone's book I can tell you <laughs> thank you yeah. <laughs> Sorry. well in yeah. your case it was possibly so good he, she didn't need yeah. to, uh, to I haven't it. it's not my style and th no that's never happened to me Sorry. Okay. okay so let's open it up for questions the lady in front the l and then a row, the l row of ladies and 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 the gentleman at the back. So first the lady here in front, and then we'll go the gentleman back. We'll be gender um, neutral. Lady. Good yeah. Good evening. Uh, hi. I would like to ask you that uh, with uh, you know the threat of AI and editing for newspaper generally being a thankless job, uh, we are never in the limelight. So how to stay at the top of your game and stay self-motivated? You're the AI person. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. answer this. Yeah, but you're the editor, newspaper. No, I okay, I can tell you how you stay self I can't actually tell you how to stay self-motivated. That's too big a question. But what I can say is, I mean, if you love your job, just, I would say, show up every day and see yeah. what you're bringing to it. Uh, stay curious about it and don't take it too seriously. Don't ever confuse your life with your work. I'm a big believer in keeping the two things very separate. You should have other interests in your life apart from your work. Don't lose uh, yeah. any, you don't lose sleep over your work ever. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, well, I would g go along with that 100%. As a journalist, you never lost sleep over your work? No. That's very good advice. No, I, do, I still don't. <laughs> Um, yeah. The gentleman at the back. <laughs> Life goes on. 
and I know gentleman. The lady there, and then the gentleman. Yeah, the gentleman back with the with the editing is made in the perspective of reader or the writer. Editing is what? Sorry. Uh, made, uh, do you do look at the reader or the writer? It be respect. Or, the ed editing is meant for the reader. The whole purpose of the editor is the editor is the stage between you writing and the reader reading it. The editor must ultimately keep the reader in mind because if the reader doesn't want a bad book, a boring book, a book that's repetitive, a book that's hard to read, writers are not always objective about our own work. That's why we need editors to look at it as our first readers. Yeah, Isn't I think it? that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. An editor is nothing more than a first reader. That's it. The lady in front? No, the lady in the jacket, I'm sorry. And then you. Then you, I'm sorry. Hello, uh, I'm Malvika and I, I wanted to ask you the panel, like as ma'am has only introduced her AI editrix and on the other hand you also said that we need good editors, right? So it's a bit confusing. Do you think it, the job will be relevant in the coming years? Because I myself uh, have a background of literature and I'm very interested and I've also edited a couple of books. So I would want to know the relevance of the job in the coming years from the respective panel. Am I English? Yeah, you one yes. of them. All right, okay. Yes, good <laughs> <Yes. laughs> talk to me. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that I first of all to be very clear, I did not make this app to replace editors. I don't think you can replace editors because what they bring, which AI does not have, is taste and judgment. Taste is something you develop, and judgment hopefully is also something you develop. Yeah. Uh, it can be easily lost, both of them, but uh, still you hold on to them for dear life. But I would say, um, you know, to be an editor, you have to have books to edit. Most, and you have to be learned from someone. So the, I made this because you can learn on it 10 times faster than you normally would because where are you going to find it? An editor is going to sit and teach yeah. you over five years. Nobody is going to do that. True. So that's why I made it because I want to be able to let anybody put a manuscript there and it will walk you through it and you will learn, you will be a better editor for it. And it's not that you just put it in there and it spits it out. It is, I would say it makes a bad editor good, a good editor great and a great editor a superhero. And that's what it does. <clears throat> also in the context of Indian journalism and the poor level of editing at the moment, Artificial intelligence is better than no intelligence at all, no? Oh, God. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the desk is really going to go out wow. to get you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a doctor by profession. Yeah, love it. And uh, my two questions. First is, ki with AI coming in big way, I'm sure the editor's job will go off in 10 years. <laughs> AI will take over everything, even medicine. But at present, if I pe send a paper, medical paper I'm talking of, in our journals, chat GPT or that, they'd have a screening and that is rejected if you have used AI. I don't know about you people, but in medical journal, it's still rejected. You mean to write a paper or edit it? Yeah, yeah. Writing a paper, if I write a paper and if we take a help of AI, it gets rejected. Yes, At present, yes. As yeah. it should. But yeah, it yeah, should. It yeah. should yeah. But yeah. subsequently, I think everything will be taken over by AI in 10 years. We so, so I, I don't understand the question. So. so, I was wondering if your jobs will also be uh, <laughs> taken no, no, over by your, AI. Your question is predicated on the assumption that, ten, year, that 10 years from now, yeah. there will still be newspapers. So, yeah. I question that assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And people well, well, reading them because the younger generation is not reading them actually. Yeah. Yeah. They read the Twitter. Correct. Well, That's what I said. Yeah. That's true. But, but I there will always be books. I mean, the one interesting thing about this shift to new media and social media is that books continue to sell. I, I read all my books now on a computer or on Kindle, mm. but I still read them. So books, I think the one form of writing that will survive. That's Would true. I think it'll thrive. Yeah. And I think it'll thrive because of AI. I done, there's two reasons, if you don't mind yeah. my getting into. One is, of course, because people want to read books yeah. and there is an originality to the, lev and the level of thinking and depth that you get, which only a book can give you. And the second is a more selfish reason is, uh, you know, we are not very far away from the point where the AI, existing AI models have trained on all of the world's data mm. and they're going to need more data, which means that original thinking will come at a higher value. Yeah. So, because 
you cannot train the next generation of AI without new material. human yeah. material. You can't train it. Also, no tweet, no Instagram post, no blog will ever give you the joy that a good book will. Absolutely. No? That's true. That's true. The, the gentleman there and the, then the gentleman, uh, or the, the gentleman with the pink, the pink, 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 this, uh, pink shirt gentleman. Short, and short, short. Hello. <laughs> it's a shirt. Okay. <laughs> okay. Point taken. Is there yeah, clearly yeah. an editor here? Yeah. <laughs> yes, true. We are, I'm from the advertising industry. Okay. I've been in the advertising industry for 35 years. I love reading and part of advertising comes out of reading. Yes. If you don't read, you can't write. Right? right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, my question, now my question is, like you just said, the lady here, she just said that the youngsters are not reading enough. I agree. 110%. My question now is, Veer, you've been in Delhi a very long time. Yeah. Today, books are sold on the roadside and shoes are sold in air-conditioned shops. Now tell me who the hell is going to read a book when it's, re when it's sold on the roadside and a Reebok or a shoe or a sneaker is selling for 5,000 and people are going in there and buying them and they are selling in air-conditioned showrooms. Look at the change from your generation. I come from the same generation that I see in the 30 years, there's been a tremendous, tremendous change in reading. Nobody wants to read. Everybody wants to, like the lady said, Google. Are saab, Google guru se bhi bada ho gaya. <laughs> nahi? Yeah. Google two, guru yeah. se bhi bada ho gaya. I take your point, but just two things. One is that while it's true that the average person who would read magazines, newspapers is reading less, people are still buying books. Yeah, More yeah, books yeah. are sold now yeah, than yeah, ever yeah, have yeah. been sold. That's the true. second no, thing right. is, I'll give you an anecdote. Yeah. A guy, a headhunter, came from, I won't name the city, in the Far East to yeah. meet me, to ask me if I would edit a newspaper there. And he said to me, he said, you know, India will go far. So I said, why? He said, because when I stop at a traffic light or I pass a pavement, people are either trying to sell me or are buying books on self-help, books on being successful, books on the state of the world. In no other Asian country, yeah, certainly yeah. not in China, is that happening. So this is a society that's trying to improve itself. Yeah, and for so example, I agree with you, there are no yeah. air-conditioned cabins. But thank is you. that thank such a bad thing? Just, just one second. All right. For example, no, newspapers. You know, Chinese I think this woman, still, this still lady will venture out of your hands quickly. I, I, I read the editorial every day of a newspaper. Yeah. I want to ask how many people in the audience Read the editorial of a newspaper, for example, the Denik Baskar or a Patrika but or a Times of India. We are all journalists and we are all readers, so we definitely read. In the audience, okay, everybody. Let's, let's, let's have a final question. By judging, okay. by, judging by the numbers. Koi nahi padta hai. Answer to your question, koi nahi padta hai. I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> nahin, nahin. The gentleman in, uh, in front and then the lady right at the back in black. Right at the back. Well, I mean, uh, my question is that, you know, the in the coming future, will it be the end of uh, uh, independent journalism and especially uh, freedom of press with the AI editor in place and the corporate owners, you know, enjoying the scene, you know? Thank you so much. Is that no, a it's, it's a possibility, you know, that you proprietor sack all the journalists, hire a few bots, take instructions from the government and the newspapers appear without any cost. Ho <laughs> uh, I would say just something different. Actually, it's not uh, you know, the newspaper which will be sacked, it's the proprietor who will be sacked. Because there is a barrier to entry to journalism, writing books, uh, making movies, whatever it might be. That is the threat or risk or benefit of AI, whichever way you look at it. I don't think there's any worry that uh, people are not going to be making newspapers or writing uh, books. If anything, I just think a lot more people will be doing it. But they will not need a proprietor to do it. They can just do it on their own. That's called Twitter. <laughs> no, I mean, but it, that's, that's why it's that's popular. Yeah, because no, there's a long-form yeah. version of that. Yeah. It's accessible to everyone. Yeah. It's a Correct. level playing field. Like so it's a level, it. anybody yeah. can become a proprietor yeah. of their own newspaper like, now. Like, yeah. like look at the YouTube channels. I yeah, mean, that's... Exactly, that's, that's exactly. Who um, made news television irrelevant. Of course. Exactly. All, same all thing will happen. I mean, all the studios, the 
the, the lady right at the back um, with spectacles. The one who had her hand up. Yeah, the one. This is the, this is the last question. The lady. In, do you want to just come up in front? No, right at the back. Right, do you want to come in front? And we're. Yes. Hi, I am in the education industry for past 23 years. I want your comments on chat GPT. Students are giving ex ex uh, tests on chat GPT. So what do you have to say there? This is all Meru's area, yes. so you can answer it. Okay. Um, so actually, there have been a lot of academic studies on this. Uh, a lot of US universities are doing academic work on AI produced output and whether it improves the output given by whether it's students, researchers, lawyers. There's a lot of study. And Actually, it improves, in many cases, improves the level of what is being brought out by journalists, by authors, by um, students sometimes. I don't think the problem to me is that, you know, is, is using it going to be a bad thing or not. I, as long as you preserve the practice of critical thinking, that is what you have to preserve. Not, I mean, think of it like a calculator rather than just doing it on a, by hand. Um, and I think that if schools, universities focus on critical thinking and helping students to think originally and give them the power of AI, they'll only be helped by it, is my view. Uh, if I could just ask very quickly. Oh. I, I think, think we're out of time. Being told to get the yeah, hell out of here. He's, he's, if you want to talk to anybody, yeah. Buy Veer's book, get it signed, and ask him all the questions you yeah, want. I'm looking at the expressions of everybody here. I don't think we can have another question.